I saw it when we looked at Genesis chapter 28 to uh, an earlier to make the case that while it was certainly the case and true that God had determined to bless Jacob rather than Esau, even though Esau was the firstborn, that the deception plotted by uh, Rebecca and carried forth by Jacob was nevertheless wrong and wicked and suggested that this is uh, following a familiar pattern going back to at least as far back as uh, Sarah and Hagar and Abraham, where God makes a promise and it looks like, hey, it might not come true. Things are looking kind of bad. It's getting kind of scary. We better do something. And what we choose to do is to disobey the plain teaching of God. Well, I believe certainly that Jacob would have received the blessing that he was called to receive from God's hand without uh, deceiving his father if he had uh, remained faithful. Well, now we come to a situation where the, uh, the tide has turned in a manner of speaking. We're in a situation where now, uh, in pursuit of a wife, Jacob finds himself uh, back in the old country with his uh, relatives, and he stays for a time, just as the servant of Abraham did, uh, seeking out a wife for uh, Isaac. Now here's Jacob seeking out a wife for himself. He's there for about a month. He's with Laban and his family, and he decides that it would be his uh, desire to marry uh, Rachel. And so Laban, who was very shrewd and knowing that uh, he had quite an asset in Rachel, uh, decided to uh, use that asset to get some good labor out of Jacob. I mean, he cuts him a deal. You work for me for seven years, I'll give you my daughter Rachel. And so eager, so zealous, so happy to do that, in order to get uh, Rachel as his wife, Jacob sets about to do his work. Uh, he should have known, probably at this point, that Laban wasn't a terribly honorable fellow, given this uh, deal. But nevertheless, he thinks, I'll overcome Laban's dishonor by just moving forward and doing, being diligent in my work. Maybe he's thinking, I've learned my lesson from my deceit, and now I'm going to try to be honorable and honest. Uh, God has now promised that he's going to walk with me, so I am learning uh, to better trust him. So I'm going to trust this situation. I'm going to set aside my own desires, do this work, and get the blessing of this woman for my wife. So he works his seven years. And of course, you know the rest of the story. He has his wedding. Uh, he goes into his wife, and lo and behold, uh, it turns out that it is not the woman that he wanted to marry, Rachel, but it is instead Leah. I don't know, the Bible doesn't say, but surely it seems exceedingly likely that Whatever that moment was when Jacob realized that he had been had, it wouldn't have taken him long to jump back to the day that he received his father's blessing. Surely he must have seen the connection between his deceit and the deceit of Laban, his deceiving and his being deceived. Surely that must have jumped out at him. This blessing, my father, Isaac, wanted to go to Esau, and I took it. And now I wanted to marry Rachel, but instead I've been given Leah. Now, one of the things that's hard about texts like this is we know so little, not only of the customs of the day, we know even less about the reasoning behind the customs. You think to yourself, how in the world is it possible that he could have been fooled? I wonder if there's some connection between uh, this story and the uh, tradition of the bridal veil and that bridal veil being lifted uh, and that kiss being given. I don't know. I don't know precisely what's going on or what the uh, uh, habits were in this day, but I do know this. I do know that Jesus said, 
And he's never wrong. Jesus said from the beginning, it was not so. That we're going to have once again, not only the sin of polygamy, but we're going to end up having the hardships that come with the sin of polygamy. So what happens next is Jacob goes and sees his now father-in-law and says, what gives? What in the world? How did you do this to me? And what does he say? A Laban says, well, you apparently don't understand our, uh, our customs either because I, I can't. I mean, it's the rule. It's the tradition that the oldest marries before the youngest, you know, kind of like it's the tradition that the firstborn receives the blessing. Yeah. Jacob is a usurper. Jacob is a, uh, a revolutionary who's willing to take uh, cultural mores and just cast them aside to get what he wants. And now the cultural more has given him what he doesn't want. Leah for a bride. Now, here's the thing about Leah. On the one hand, uh, I want to uh, you know put her in the same position as uh, Jacob, because like Jacob, when his mother said, "I want you to do this, I want you to take this food, I want you to uh, put on your brother's clothes, I want you to put on this animal fur," uh, Leah had to participate in this deception. You know. I really have a hard time understanding how this works in real life. A a time or two, not many times, but a time or two, I've actually written letters to to companies who've done this. What do they do? Well, they send you in the mail uh, a a marketing piece. They're trying to sell you something. It might be a, a good. It might be a service. It might be, you know, sign up with us for new siding for your house, or it might be subscribe to our magazine. Who knows what it is? But they're trying to sell you something. So they send you an envelope, and they mark it up so that it looks like a package from Federal Express an overnight mailing. Why would they do that? Well, they would do that because when we receive overnight mailings, our assumption is this must be something important for someone to pay extra for this, to get it to me this fast. I better look at it. Because so much of what comes in the mail that is marketing pieces just gets thrown in the trash. So they disguise their marketing piece as some important paperwork to get us to read it. And if you're smart, one, you'll be able to tell the difference between uh, fake FedEx and real FedEx. But secondly, one of the ways you can do that is look at the where the postage is. It'll say pre-sorted. It's bulk mail. It's not only not overnight mail, it's not first class mail. It's bulk mail. Well, here's what I write in these letters. I write to these people, these businesses and say, help me understand something. Your hope and your desire was that you and I would engage in a business relationship, that I would become a client or a customer of yours, and that I would pay you a certain amount of money, uh, trusting that you would provide this uh, good or this service that I would be, uh, that I would value and that I would be glad to have. And yet you made the conscious, intentional decision to begin our relationship by lying to me. Why in the world would I think I should go into business with these people? I should sign a contract with these people. I should agree to do this or to do that with or for these people when you've already established before you said hello that you're a liar. That's what Jacob is. 
That's what Laban is. That's what Leah is. Imagine if you're Leah and you want to be married. Who knows? I don't know if she's, you know, during that month that Jacob's visiting, she may be secretly crushing on him. She may be thinking, oh, if only he liked me instead of my sister. Or she may be thinking, oh, this is so embarrassing because I'm the older sister and he clearly likes her. Who knows what she's thinking? I don't know. But I do know this. I'm guessing that nobody ever wants to have their new spouse discover that you're not who you said you were. You're not who they thought they were getting. Now, we can explore the ethics of what happened and if Leah, or if rather uh, Jacob had an obligation to uh, maintain this relationship, one could argue that in our day, in our context, this would surely be grounds for an annulment. Uh, but apparently that wasn't how they looked at things. And apparently the better solution was they take Rachel also. Now, there is some dispute. And again, I don't know uh, more than a handful of most basic words in Hebrew. So I don't have a, enough knowledge to have a, a position on the matter about whether or not uh, Jacob went and served seven more full years in order to marry uh, Rachel, or whether or not it was a literal week that he only served uh, seven more days and then married Rachel. But one thing I want you to notice about the story is that for all of or whatever guilt she may have had for participating in this uh, duplicitous uh, scheme of Laban's, uh, Leah seems to have uh, had some level of spiritual maturing as she's giving birth to these children. God is gracious to her. God notices and knows the hardship that she has being this third wheel in this relationship. And God doesn't bless Rachel with children, uh, but he does bless Leah with children. And Leah gives uh, these children names that demonstrate her acknowledgement that it's God who gave them, that it's God who's blessing them, that it's God who is the source of her joy and her peace. And so in that chapter, you see some level of uh, spiritual growth on Leah's part. What we don't know, what's not particularly clear, and really for the rest of the, of the time of the relationship, and th there's, a, there's some moral ambiguity about all the characters in this story. Uh, you know, it's certainly possible that at some level, Jacob learned a powerful lesson here. It's possible he could have learned it sooner, maybe when he was wrestling or when he was uh, at Bethel, when he, when the, he saw the uh, uh, ladder going up to heaven. Maybe it, that convicted him and maybe he thought, man, I really did wrong. I shouldn't have deceived. I, I don't know. I don't know where or when his repentance came. I do know that the rest of the relationship between Jacob and Laban is continues to be marked by uh, levels of deception and trickery and uh, really not uh, cooperation. Now, the, again, the, the general common perception is that what's happened here is that Jacob, the deceiver, has met his match in Laban. That Laban is uh, maybe a little less tricky, a little less clever, but a little more brash a little more willing to uh, push the envelope because, you know, part of the whole part uh, uh, necessity for conning people is uh, getting them to trust you. And so when you look kind of and act kind of uh, dishonorable, it's hard to, to get much of a con over. And so uh, there's some back and forth. And as we're going to see later, one could even argue that uh, Jacob has a level of shrewdness that enables him to uh, to take advantage and to harness uh, Laban's uh, crookedness to Jacob's advantage, almost like uh, those martial arts where you use your opponent's momentum against him uh, so that even if you don't have much strength, you can still... Uh, protect yourself. Well, this is now on a, in, in the game of cons, so to speak. So 
that's what's happening here in Genesis 29. It's not pretty. Now, I want to remind you of a principle that we've already spoken about and that we do need to keep in the forefront of our minds. And that's simply this. We need to remember that this story is originally being told by Moses to God's people, not in the context in which the story happened, but in the context of God's people having left Egypt in slavery and being on their way to the promised land. And because of that, so many of the lessons that they were called to draw and that we're called to draw apply uh, in that kind of circumstance. And one of those principles I want us to grasp is the principle that God is pleased to make straight lines out of crooked sticks. You've heard it said that you don't ever want to be on the inside seeing how either law or sausage is made. It's better just to wait for the end product and to enjoy it. But when you see it being made, all of a sudden you see all the ugliness that goes into it. On the political arena, you see hands washing other hands, uh, deals being made, and all sorts of ugliness. And of course, in the context of sausage, well, we need to, we don't need to talk about what goes into that. The point is, God doesn't use pristine, pure, perfect people to move his story forward. Yes, the center of the story, the reason for the story, the hero of the story is, in fact, pure and pristine and perfect. But every other actor in the story has more than his or her share of weaknesses. We're not supposed to come to these accounts and because Jacob is the one through whom the promise comes, we say that he wears the white hat and Laban wears the black hat. We're not supposed to think that because Jacob loved Rachel, that Rachel is the heroic one and that Leah is the wicked one. We're not supposed to think even that uh, Jacob is the pure and pristine one and Esau is the evil one. In fact, we're going to see their reconciliation and uh, we'll see what that may mean in coming chapters. But in the meantime, we need to remember that God is pleased to use all of us with our weaknesses and our feet of clay. God is not saying to you, you need to perfect yourself. You need to rid yourself of all of your sin, and then I'll be able to find a way to use you. Yes, of course, we're called to be zealous for our sanctification. We're to labor for it. We're to mortify our flesh. We're to buffet our bodies. Yea and amen to zeal for our sanctification. But never let the devil tell you that you're not good enough for God to use you, not because you are good, but because God uses people who are not good. He does it in this story. He does it in my story. He does it in your story. He does it in all stories. And in like manner, be sure that you're not quick to diminish or to denigrate the stories of others simply because those stories involve people who are sinners. It's everywhere you look, except for Jesus. So as we conclude with Genesis chapter 29, and before we move on to Genesis chapter 30, let's not be surprised as we see Uh, People with sinful habits, even sinful habits that they're aware of, even sinful habits that they may have repented for, they're still struggling, they're still battling, and it's going to keep going even as our story moves forward.